Okay, well, welcome everyone to today's supper discussion um, on the intersection of survey and passive data. Um, my name is Stacey Bricka, and along with um, our presenters, our moderators, and then our uh, Guy Rousseau, who is in the background doing the chat um, and the Q&A management, we wanted to welcome you guys to this discussion. Um, the focus or the, the beginning of this discussion came uh, with the ITM uh, Innovations and Travel Modeling Conference. We had several submissions that seemed to go back and forth and, you know, surveys are bad, passive data is bad, what are we going to do? Um, and so we went uh, and we looked to try to design a, um, a session for ITM or a series of sessions so that we as a community could discuss this topic. And so we appreciate Zephyr bringing us forward um, to be able to um, provide this discussion. I am going to share an opening presentation just so that we can kind of organize our thoughts on this. Um, and before we get going, the, the reason for this topic is very clear. Um, we did a red and part of our registration, we had the survey asking if you prefer a traditional type of travel survey or if your needs could be met with passive data. Um, and almost half of us said that both data sources, that some combination of both data sources was what we needed. 20% um, so, so said, no, we still need our traditional survey data. 17% felt that um, what we what passive data provides is what we could use. And then we've got the it depends uncertain and other, um, which always exists in every survey. Um, and so we're moving towards both. Um, this might be an interesting poll to ask each year just to measure as a community where our changes are. Um, but what we're hoping to do with the session today is my there we go. Two, two key goals of what we want to do. One is just build on shared knowledge um, and who's doing what and give some examples of the use of survey and passive data so that together we can advance the state of the practice. The second thing that we want to do is really identify priorities um, that help us to move forward. What are the research topics? What are the lessons learned? Where and how can we better communicate who's doing what so that we're able to, um, to move forward to not reinvent the wheel um, and to have the opportunity periodically to share what's going on um, so that as you are using one or the other of the data sources or both as our different presentations today will focus on, you'll know um, the advantages, disadvantages and just to help refine our decision making. So, um, and I think that the, the Zephyr page for the event description described this, but we have three different parts to the session. Um, part, and each one has a moderator, presenters, and an opportunity for discussion. So we've got three discussion points coming. Um, for part one, we're looking at using a survey and passive data to capture special events data for modeling and, and transportation planning. In the second, we're looking at where passive and survey data are fused, and then also where they can be used side by side based on what your research question is or what your data need is. How can these two parallel products be used. Um, and then the third part of the session is really more of an open discussion. We'll start with a discussant to kind of set the stage, close us out from the details of part one and two and move us into the full discussion. And at that point, we'll have some panel discussion and then some Q&A um, coming from the floor and coming from you as our attendees. I think we have more than 150 people registered, some overflow into the, um, the YouTube site. So um, we've got the Q&A, we're monitoring that, we're gonna try to bring it all in together. And then uh, all the slides and the Q&A and responses will be posted um, to the Zephyr site. So even if we don't hear your voice today, your questions will be heard. <laughs> so, um, so at this point, we wanted to go ahead and get some input from you and just understand who better is in our audience. And so we've got a poll to launch, um, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and give you a minute or two to, to respond, um, and then we'll get going with the key part of the program. I should have queued up background music. Sorry, <laughs> the Jeopardy question, dude. Um, so, okay. 
So it, it looks like we've got, I'm gonna go ahead and just end it there so we don't take up as much time, but we've got 61% of our attendees, oh, share results, there we go. So almost two thirds of us are coming from government or public agencies, another 30% coming from the private sector, um, and then the remainder coming from academia. So Greg, you're represented, um, uh, about five, six, seven percent coming from academic staff and then students. And oh, I'm sorry, 3% other. I told you that always appears. So um, so we've got a good mix primarily towards the government. And I did see for our opening question uh, and the information y'all submitted with your registration data that several are joining because you really don't know um, whether it's the survey data or the passive data and you're trying to make decisions for your agency. So hopefully through the discussions and the presentations today, um, it'll give you a good idea of at least what questions you need to ask to answer that question for your agency. So I am gonna stop sharing at this point and I'm gonna turn the session over to Lita Hunsinger, who is our first moderator and for our first panel. Okay, thank you, Stacy. Um, again, welcome everybody. We got some great presentations lined up and I know you're looking forward to the discussion. So let's get started with our first presenter. And our first presenter today is Lavanya, and I'm probably not gonna say your last name correctly, but I'll give it a shot. Vali Hanini, uh, who is a program manager with- Okay, thank you. Um, who is a program manager with Maricopa Association of Governments. Lavanya specializes in travel demand modeling and has managed numerous data collection projects over her career. She is gonna be presenting today on a special events survey. So with that, Lavanya, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lita, for the introduction. Thank you, Lita, for the introduction and thanks to the fight team for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a recent study special event survey we did at Maricopa Association of Governments. Uh, MAG is a metropolitan organization and we do regional planning for the Phoenix metro area. And we did this project in partnership with Cambridge Systematics as our prime consultant and West Group Research as our Subconsultant. I'm going to give a brief background about uh, special events model. Uh, MAG originally developed this model back in 1999, and it uh, and this is first of its kind, uh, and uh, and the first model using special events data. Uh, MAG is a pioneer uh, when it comes to special events model. Uh, and we did this study to see the impact of special events on transportation infrastructure. And uh, we spelled out the importance of special events model uh, in FDA grant proposal in 2008. And we successfully, uh, we were successfully awarded with the grant. The main purpose of this survey is to collect uh, travel and socio socioeconomic information pertaining to special events and to better understand special events impact on transit markets. And we also wanted to update our traditional four-step uh, travel demand model and activity-based model. Uh, because of uh, special events, there is a, increase, a lot of increase in transit ridership. We wanted to see that impact, how it is impacting the high capacity transit corridors. Uh, we did this service in 2009. I'm going to talk here the main survey differences between 2009 and 2019. Uh, in 2009, uh, we collected roughly 6,000 surveys from 20 special events, and uh, it is all one page uh, paper questionnaire, and uh, it was intercept surveys, which took like two to three minutes of attendees time. And in 2009, we selected 38 special events, but we were only able to do 33 special event surveys because of uh, COVID-19. And we collected roughly 8,800 surveys uh, in this round. And these are all tablet-based uh, intercept surveys with both online and offline versions. 
and each survey took us roughly five to seven minutes of attendance time. And the main difference between 2009 and 2019 surveys is uh, uh, we collected origin, uh, destination, as well as intermediate stop locations, whereas in 2009, uh, we did not collect intermediate stop uh, locations. And in 2019, the survey was also uh, expanded a lot. There were a lot of questions compared to 2009. We also collected gate counts, vehicle counts, uh, light rail boardings, and alight alightings in this round. Here I'm going to talk about the process overview. Uh, out of 600 plus special events that happen in Phoenix uh, metro area, we selected 38 special e events, emphasizing mostly on light rail and high capacity tra uh, transit corridors. If the events are around transit corridors, we selected those. And we also wanted to survey at, uh, big venues. And we wanted to have a good ge geographical distribution. We also lo looked into the day of week as our models are weekday models. Uh, we wanted to lo look at the surveys to be done on weekdays, but we did uh, collect weekend events as well. Lavanya, this is, this is Lita. Apologies for the interruption, but can you put your slides on presentation mode? I, I, it's a bit hard uh, to give that a shot. It's on the, okay. It is on the presentation. Center display settings up top. Okay, display settings. Swap presenter view and slideshow. Yeah, let's try that. There we go, okay. much better. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Lita. So after selecting the 38 special events, uh, we calculated the confidence level and we maintained the confidence level at 95%, uh, whereas the margin of error ranged from one to 10%. Uh, for smaller events, the margin of error was higher and for larger events, the margin of error was low. And this is because the small, uh, for the smaller events and for the events that have set time, uh, it is difficult to collect service in the short span of time. That's the reason we gave uh, margin of error high. And uh, after that, uh, we did uh, we did lot of logistics. Uh, uh, we approached MAG member agencies to obtain permissions from venues rather than approaching us directly the venues. Uh, and also the, we provided director's letter from MAG to the venue. And there was a lot of communication between the consultants, the venue staff and us. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of intercept planning. Like we had to uh, decide uh, how many interviews we, we will need on the survey day and where to place them, uh, uh, things like so uh, things like that, we, we had a lot of back and forth uh, communications to plan. And uh, the picture here shows the yellow stars where we wanted to place the attendees uh, to do the service and the uh, uh, attendees movement. And after the pre-event uh, planning uh, on the event day, the surveyors uh, collected the data, uh, uh, did the surveys, and uh, we after the event is over, we called the venue staff and took the total attendance. Uh, and also, if they have uh, automated uh, ticket counters, we asked them for gate counts, uh, gate uh, gate counts, and uh, we and. We had a post uh, event re recap with the uh, consultants as and uh, venue staff. Uh, once we collected all the information, we cleaned the data. Uh, uh, West Group Research uh, cleaned the data and provided to us for geocoding. And then uh, Cambridge Systematics did the data expansion and analysis reports. Uh, we shared the results with the venue staff because they were very interested to look at the results. Uh, and they also included a few questionnaire along with our questions, uh, like how did you hear about this event? So the results, uh, uh, they, they were very interested in the results and it was like mutual benefit uh, for the event uh, venue staff and as well as us. 
the map here shows the geographical distribution of the events we surveyed and the types of uh, events we, we collected the data for. It ranged from cultural to sports. We tried to maintain as many types of events as possible. And the observations uh, uh, we noted from the surveys are most of the uh, events origin and destination are from home location. But when we compare it to weekday and weekend, uh, there are a lot of uh, work trips uh, on a weekday compared to we, uh, we, uh, weekend. When it comes to choice of mode uh, for people, uh, in general, auto is the major mode used by majority of people, but it also dependent uh, by each uh, event type. Uh, for college games like basketball games, we noticed a lot of non-motorized trips. And uh, for October 1st, first event, we noticed taxi and uh, ride share mode increase. And observations by age, uh, like uh, events like college games and concerts, so these were attended by attendees under the age of uh, 26. Uh, and family events like cultural festivals like Discover India and uh, Mighty Mud Mania, these events were attended by attendees uh, ranging from 36 to 45. Uh, we noticed the uh, Phoenix Rising soccer game. It was attended by families, but majorly fathers bringing uh, the kids to the event. And uh, Barrett Jackson uh, waste management and spring training events, those were attended by the attendees uh, with ages ranging from 56 and over. And uh, uh, with the Barrett Jackson event, we also noticed there was a lot of car ownership compared to other events. The lessons what we learned uh, from this survey is that we needed multiple levels and options for location verification uh, to improve the geocoding. And as I mentioned before, uh, each event uh, is different. Uh, uh, the, more the more choice of people differed by each event, also the party size uh, differed and also the age groups differed. So each event is a unique, uh, unique and this confirmed us to survey many different types of events throughout the region. And smaller events uh, did not have much impact on uh, light rail ridership or traffic on roadways uh, surrounding the events. And intercept uh, surveys are very valuable to capture uh, information, demo, uh, information like uh, party size uh, uh, and demographics and as well as trip chain pattern of attendees. The potential next steps, what we are looking into is uh, obtaining LBS data, street light or trajectory data and to validate uh, for smaller events and to validate uh, this data with the intercept surveys uh, and also to use this uh, data to, uh, to validate our uh, forecasting models where we don't have gate counts or vehicle counts. And we want to utilize this data to update our special events models. Uh, with this, I end my presentation and uh, I forward to Lita. Hey, thank you so much, Slavanya, for sharing your information with us today. Um, I think that what I would like to do is hold questions until the end of this first session, uh, just in the interest of time. We did have one question come into the chat box, but it looks like Rachel Copperman answered that question. So with that, um, again, thank you, Lavanya, and we'll open it up to questions at the end of this particular session. So I think I wanna turn us to a poll next. Um, so let me launch this poll and give folks an opportunity to answer a question related to your experience on working with passive data. The answers are coming in. We're at about 50% voted. Give it just a minute more. So it don't look like we have any rock stars in passive data out there. We have a few. All right, I'm going to end polling in the interest of time and share the results. 
Um, so yeah, it looks like that uh, that most of us are kind of in that in that low range there with one to three projects of experience. We've got a few rock stars out there with uh, more than six uh, projects working with passive data, but looks like the majority of us are newbies and, and in a learning mode. So hopefully this um, presentation is going to help help achieve that for you. Um, so. Lavanya, if you'll stop sharing your screen and I'm gonna move on to our second presenter in this first session. Okay. And that presenter is Sumit uh, Kishnani, who works with Stantec Sports and Resorts Group. I had no idea that there was even a group called Sports and Resorts, so I found that very interesting. Um, this is a group that focuses on improving operations at special events for locations throughout the world. And Sumit is going to be presenting today on applications of big data for event operations planning. So with that, Sumit, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Lita. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, you also are not in presenter mode. So if you'll um, go up to the top there under display settings and put yourself in presenter ah. mode. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, so this is um, a, a, um, an introduction of how we use location-based data, specifically street light data to better understand and quantify uh, strategies to improve ingress and egress operations at the New Islanders Arena, uh, adjacent to the existing Belmont Park. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the challenges were and how we use uh, location-based data to improve the to improve the uh, the set of strategies that we use to manage travel demand and more importantly to quantify that. So a little bit of a project overview. Can, can we Belmont Racetrack is uh, located on the border between Queens and Nassau near New York City. Uh, the Islanders play most of their games at Nassau Coliseum. Actually, in the past few seasons, they split their games between Nassau Coliseum and Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn. So they were both about equidistant from um, the new, where the new arena is going to be adjacent to Belmont Racetrack. Uh, and then the Cross Island Parkway is the road that runs adjacent to uh, the site. We were asked to do a uh, traffic study to look at what the impact would be and how we could better manage the travel demand for people coming to and from Islanders events. And this is important for uh, the reason that all traffic studies are important, but it's also, uh, we found it's important for all of our clubs because it has a direct impact on the guest experience and you know whether people want to come to the event or they just stay at home and, and watch on their big screen TV. So if you can provide a more positive guest experience, it makes the guests want to keep on coming back and renew their uh, tickets year after year. And that's very important for um, the, the cash flow for the, for the facilities and also for the guest experience. A um, little bit of overview, the Cross Island Parkway uh, currently without an arena adjacent to it looks uh, very congested. This is an older picture. There's no construction there right now, but it's three lanes per direction. Uh, it's very congested. It's not a, a open to um, uh, heavy vehicles in most sections. And um, we're talking about introducing a new arena adjacent to it. So we needed a combination of strategies to manage the total travel demand. We have to talk about mode shifts, getting people to give up uh, their automobile and, and consider all, uh, other modes of travel. So that includes um, enhancing the transit modes. We talked about early arrival incentives, getting people to come in outside the peak and then stay late uh, instead of departing when everybody else departs to uh, stay for some of the other ancillary activities that we had planned after the event, uh, carpooling incentives and in the form of parking incentives for people who decided to carpool, direct communication with the fans so you can let them know about incidents, let them know about construction impacts, uh, signage and wayfinding to support all of this, to um, specifically support background traffic diversions um, and a number of these strategies. And the question that we uh, were posed with is how do we quantify this? It's one thing to do a survey of everybody who's going to your event, which we had uh, also um, done for this as well, where we looked at people who went to Islanders events and we know where they come from, we know uh, how many games they go to, but how do you quantify something like uh, background traffic diversions? And what we did is we turned to uh, street light data. Uh, we looked at the alternatives. Traditionally, we would have used a Bluetooth OD survey, a license plate survey, potentially an aerial survey uh, using something like Skycom, where you trace individual vehicles through the, uh, the study area or questionnaire intercept surveys. And again, the challenge with that was you're not trying to 
divert the traffic that's going to the event, you're trying to take the background traffic and move them to a different road. So you don't have, it's not as easy to um, obviously do a questionnaire intercept survey for that kind of background traffic. Uh, the benefits of streetlight as we found it, where it's less expensive um, than doing a full-on survey. We have a, a much larger sample size, which is one of the things that we were actually surprised about is that we got about 30% of all the travelers on the road that we were, uh, we were examining. You have a historical database, so you can go back in time and look at multiple event days rather than just the you know, one or two survey days that you've done. And then it has multiple applications beyond just the, the, the transportation applications. Um, guest relations thought this was great because they could actually see which people were coming to different events based on who the opponent was, uh, the time of day, the day of week, um, and all those other things, which is very useful for them to update their database. So um, our background traffic diversion methodology, what we did is we um, broke up the entire New York metro area into multiple regions. The idea was we wanted to identify who is on the Cross Island Parkway that's going to local destinations and who's on there that's going to further away destinations with the understanding that if you're not going to a place directly along this roadway, then it might be easier to, to, to uh, divert that person to another north-south roadway that maybe is not as congested or certainly is not as impacted by event traffic. And so we broke up the region into multiple um, different regions, uh, as you can see over here. Um, and we wanted to identify what's the mix of long distance and short distance uh, trips. Um, so our analysis location, what we did in Streetlight is we effectively set up a, uh, a zone on the Cross Island Parkway, northbound and southbound, so we have it by direction. And we just wanted to get it, the local origins and destinations for everybody who's traveling through this zone. So we'll know, are they coming locally? Are they here because they're uh, getting on at, at a local destination and getting off at, at a local, um, local origin, local destination near the parkway, or is it more long distance trips? And what we found is uh, we broke this up into census block groups. You can break it up into zip codes or TACs or a number of different uh, preset regional geographies. And we summarized this. We said, well, let's look at how many people are coming from each of these different uh, geographic regions uh, through the Cross Island Parkway, how many people are passing through here. Um, and what we found was very surprising, actually, that um, if you look at where the arena is and uh, the red line is the Cross Island Parkway, we found that almost 30% of the traffic that was on this road was not local traffic. They were going to long distance destinations in terms of they were going to New Jersey or Western Queens or going to uh, Suffolk and, e and Eastern Nassau counties, which were you know, more than 10 miles away from where this road was, suggesting that they could take one of the other north-south roadways, uh, which had more capacity, uh, which was not as congested as the Cross Island Parkway, and certainly would not have the event um, travel demand that the Cross Island Parkway would have since that was a primary access road getting into and out of uh, the arena. Um, we also used this information to look at the fan home and work locations. And one of the things that we found was um, that, again, knowing that the Islanders played at two different venues, the Nassau Coliseum in Long Island and the uh, Atlantic Yards um, facility in Brooklyn, we found that the, the, the people who were going to these events, the demographics of the people going to these events were very different between the two facilities. Uh, there was a difference between weeknight and weekday patterns, uh, but it was also the Brooklyn facility was more of a, a Manhattan-based crowd and people coming in from New Jersey. And the, uh, the Long Island facility was more based on Long Island. So as you're starting to see more of this, um, you know, some other clubs are starting to go to multi-venue um, uh, frameworks where, you know, for example, I think the Rays are going to play half their games in uh, potentially in Montreal and the other half in Tampa Bay. It's because they have, they're trying to capitalize on a larger fan base. And if you have fewer events for each one of those fan bases, then you're more likely to draw um, people to each one of those events. So just something that's becoming more prevalent um, in, in the different sports leagues that we've seen. Um, what was interesting was we had this, when we were able to look at not just the local origins and destinations, but also the national origins and destinations. So when the Islanders, for example, played a game against the Kings, we went and looked at specific event days, we saw a lot of people that had their home locations in California, whereas when they played a game against uh, Tampa Bay, we know that there were a lot more people coming in from uh, Florida, for example. Um, the other applications that we use for location-based data, we use it to identify park and ride facilities, setting up zones along the roadways where we wanted to put park and ride facilities, and just look at that and say how much of the traffic that's going to Nassau Coliseum or going to um, 
Atlantic Yards, for example, is already passing through these facilities. That's an indicator that if we put some kind of a sign up there, then maybe we can divert this traffic to those facilities rather than having to get people to change their routes to use that park and ride. Um, we also use this to identify cut through traffic. There was concern since uh, this arena is located near uh, residential neighborhoods, would there be cut through traffic? So we took a look at what happens, for example, right now for Nassau Coliseum events, but more importantly for this community, for what happens on um, Belmont Park race days on um, the major um, horse race events. Um, and we were able to identify the cut through traffic and come up with mitigation strategies for that. It's also useful for uh, road and lane closures and monitoring and evaluation studies. So at, once the stadium is open, once the arena is open, we're going to continue to use this data to monitor traffic patterns, monitor travel times on the Cross Island Parkway and compare them to what they were uh, before the arena opened and also compare between event days and non-event days. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we thought that location-based data was extremely helpful in quantifying the effectiveness of all these travel demand management strategies. Uh, if you were to ask somebody, how do you know what, what volume of traffic you could divert without knowing where people are going, it would be hard to really quantify that. Uh, but knowing that 30% of the traffic is long distance helped us put a, a ballpark range around how much we thought we would be able to divert. Uh, we're able to determine differences in travel patterns between different events. We looked at weeknight and week weekend events, different opponents, for example, and saw that there was a significant change in who was going to those events. And um, we've done this normally, like I said, historically with Bluetooth OD and uh, license plate surveys, but the sample size is much larger than we could we ever achieve with those surveys when we we're able to capture 30% of the entire traveling public. Um, and then this data was also very useful, like I said, for club marketing purposes, knowing where people are coming from and the demographics of the fans is, is useful for um, has a lot more applications beyond just uh, transportation uh, demand management. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. I'll turn it back to you, Lita. Hey, thank you so much, Samit. Um, we did have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and what I might do is encourage you to answer those in writing, Samit, given um, the limitations okay. on our time. Sure. And actually a third one came in, but I do have a question that I would like to pose to both um, you and Lavanya, and that is, and I'll, I'll have you address it first to me. Could you um, address what you think are the main biases associated with your data source that, um, that you had to take into account? And then next, Lavanya, I'll have you answer that same question. But to me, if you could go first. Sure. Um, naturally, the biases that are, are present with any kind of location-based data source, I think, is that it's um, geared more towards the people who are likely to use the apps that provide that location-based data. So I talked to one of my colleagues and you know, he said his parents have a, a smartphone, they have an iPhone, but they never install an app. They use whatever comes with it from the factory. So it's less likely for us to get uh, those kinds of users than just to get um, people who are maybe a little bit younger or more tech savvy and are able to um, you know, leverage those kinds of apps or more likely to use those kinds of apps. Okay. Uh so uh, when we did the interviews, we selected the attendees randomly. We did not uh, select certain type of people. So we tried to see there is no bias when uh, interviewing the attendees. Uh, so that's how we control the bias. But uh, if the surveyors are located near light rail stations or near uh, taxi or ride share facilities, uh, we, there might be chances uh, we might get more of light rail and ride share, but we try to train the uh, surveyors as much as possible uh, to, uh, to collect surveys from everyone without creating any bias. Okay, great. Thank you, Lavanya. Thank you, Sumit. Appreciate both your time and your presentation today. So with that, I am now gonna turn things over to Jim Hubble, who is going to lead us through part two of our session uh, on opportunities using both parallel and fused data sources. Okay. All right, thank you, Lita. And yep, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And yeah, uh, moving into part two of today's session, uh, we're gonna move away from sort of the either or question. You know, sometimes it makes sense to use one uh, over the other, passive versus uh, traditional survey data. But in many other cases, you can, you, you can combine or uh, use them in parallel. So we're gonna sort of uh, move on to a couple of presentations that address that area of the topic. So we're going to start with Greg Earhart, 
Professor Greg Erhart with University of Kentucky. And Greg is an assistant professor of civil engineering at the University of Kentucky. Before becoming an academic, he spent 13 years in practice developing and applying transportation models, including at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, and at Parsons Brinkerhoff in San Francisco. His PhD is from University College London, where he began exploring many of the topics that will be presented today. And Greg, thank you. I see you've already got your uh, presentation teed up, so I will kick it over to you. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a specific application. And I think there's something to be learned both from survey data and passive data here. And perhaps there's different pieces to the story. And mostly I want to just give some ideas and give some things to think about of how we might think about those and how we can contribute to this story, if you will. Uh, this particular one is something I started several years ago, and it's sort of like pulling the thread on a sweater. I learn a little something about it and then observe something else, and off we go as we dig into a different data set or look at a different part of it. And I want to go back seven years to 2013, and I was uh, sitting in San Francisco doing activity-based travel models, and I had a very nice travel model uh, uh, for the MTC at that time that we had recently finished calibrating to 2010 household survey data. Um, I was excited to use it for a new application, and this application was the BART Seismic Retrofit Project. And we were looking at essentially which segments of the BART uh, network you needed uh, most to preserve in an earthquake zone, uh, either for, uh, uh, for sort of the seismic retrofit bit. So it went through, ran some scenarios that was kind of fun that went okay, uh, with the exception that um, I went, I presented the results to uh, BART, the planners there, and said, hey, here's what we're finding. Um, feeling pretty good about it. And they said, well, yeah, that's very nice, except for the fact that our 2013 ridership is higher than your 2020 forecast. What's going on there? Um, and I thought, oh, well, that's interesting very much. And I went back and came up with some quick and dirty fix to uh, make it better. Um, but sort of their, their, their hypothesis, as well, this shows that millennials want to use transit more and uh, there's this generational shift on trends. And well, I'm not so sure. Maybe there's something about that, but let's deal with it for now. And then let's come back and look at it later. Uh, so later on, I had the chance to start looking at it. And what we see when we start looking at the trends is typically we might calibrate our travel models every five years. Maybe we do a household travel survey every 10 years, something like that. And when you look at, in this case, the red line is BART ridership. The purple line is toll transactions on the Bay Bridge, and the blue line is Muni local bus ridership. When you look at it in five-year increments, it looks like there's not much going on. But if we switch to annual data for that very same data set, um, you see that there's all of a sudden a lot more action. There's a lot more lumps in there. Uh, and when we start to do that, those lumps seem to correspond to uh, specific events. Um, so you see the dot-com boom show up pretty clearly and the financial crisis show up pretty clearly. Uh, BART opens its uh, extension to the airport. Uh, once we start looking at the data with this time dimension to it, uh, it seems pretty clear that there's something to be learned from that. And there may be value in digging in to learn from that. And so what I would argue here is that I would argue that one of the key advantages to passive data is that they're very often continuously collected. Uh, and as a result, you get this time dimension to the data that's quite hard to get in uh, uh, traditional survey data. And this provides a couple of opportunities that are important here. Uh, one is it gives us the chance to measure change in the transportation system. Uh, and second is there are specific cases uh, where we can mitigate sort of endogeneity in the data. Uh, that happens in cross-sectional data, or sort of the chicken and the egg problem. Uh, and I'll give an example here in a little bit of uh, what I mean by that. Um, so this is 2013. I went off and I moved to uh, London and I wanted to um, get a PhD. And specifically what I uh, aimed to do was to use sort of passive data, combine a bunch of them together 
uh, and reconstruct the, the evolution of travel patterns in this city, use that to measure uh, uh, the effects of changes in the transportation system. It was a really nice proposal. It got me funded. Um, and there was some good work that came out of it, but it turns out that writing a proposal to do that and making it work are two very different things. Uh, there are challenges in working with these data. Uh, availability, it's never quite as clean as we want. Um, and so it's a little harder. Um, what's actually interesting is I think Josie Kressner is on the call. Around the same time, she was doing something similar. And I think she's probably smarter than me because she got, uh, she got further than I did in this and making it work and that turned eventually into CityCast. So I'm glad to uh, see that pushing forward. Nonetheless, um, where I did find some interesting things was looking into uh, the transit side of things. And broadly, um, the idea or the basic strategy here is an old strategy. It is one uh, where I'm taking, in that case, transit smart card data automated vehicle location, passenger count data, and the GTFS, and combining the two to spit out a bunch of perform transit performance reports. And the idea here is that I had 100%, a GTFS represents 100% of the schedule, but I only get the schedule. The APC, AVL, I get um, the actual ridership, but only for 25% of the buses. Um, and then uh, the transit smart card transactions, it's only a portion of riders that do it, but theoretically you can get uh, sort of where they're boarding and something about them, maybe where they transfer, uh, the opportunity to link to a transfer. And so the basic strategy is to merge what might be smaller but richer data sets. And by rich, I mean more information per observation with larger and less rich data sets. And this is something that we've been doing for years in household surveys where we have a very rich data set in a household survey and we expand it to match uh, census totals uh, where we have um, a very big data set, but less richness. Okay, so what can we learn from doing that, getting back to the transit thing? Spitting that out, the main performance reports I got out were time series trends of these transit ridership and various factors that I expected to learn there. Or, or, or to drive those changes. And what I did is I went back and estimated time series models. Um, you can do that. You get a set of coefficients that basically tells you the elasticity of the response variable, monthly tra average weekday transit ridership in this case, to a bunch of descriptive variables. You multiply those coefficients by the known change and it tells you uh, for some period in the past, how much of the change is attributable to each of those factors. And what we found is that um, employment was growing quite a lot over this period. And the growth of employment was between 2010 and 2013 was the biggest driver of growing BART ridership. Uh, what's interesting though, is you look at um, uh, the Muni bus ridership and you had some service cuts in this period that mattered, but you also had growing employment there uh, and some service expansions, we would expect that ridership to be going up, but it wasn't. And it wasn't due to what I call an unexplained trend. There's this difference between what we expect from the known variables and what uh, we're actually observing. And you can plot this up in a plot like this where the black line is the actual ridership. And the top of the red line is what we would expect uh, from the changes in service, from uh, the changes in employment and all of these other variables. And we see that there's a pretty substantial deficit between what we're actually observing and what we would expect based on these known variables. And we don't know what's missing. None of the variables in my model describe what's missing. So this then becomes a data issue of what are the data we need to help explain this gap. Um, I hypothesized or I speculated about this time uh, that it was the introduction of ride hailing, um, but I didn't have the data with which to prove it. Um, and actually there's some debate about what the effect of ride hailing is on transit. There's an argument that it serves a first and last mile role, actually helps support transit. There's an argument that it competes with transit um, and so therefore might reduce transit ridership, but you don't have the data to do it. Um, as I started looking into this, I actually went and um, uh, talked to the folks at Uber and I said, hey, here's a study I wanna do. 
can I have Uber trips in an origin destination trip table? Aggregated, so there's no personal identifiable information. Off we go, uh, make it for an average weekday condition. Um, they said, no, we couldn't possibly do that. But did you know that um, we're really good at supporting transit ridership? So if you want very detailed trip level data on all the trips to and from rail stations, we're happy to give that to you. And I said, well, that doesn't really help with what I'm trying to analyze. Um, so I did something else instead. And what I did is I connected up with uh, um, some smart folks in San Francisco County. And they had in parallel been trying to understand the effects of TNCs, in parallel been um, uh, running into problems getting data on TNCs. And so they actually connected up with some computer scientists at Northeastern University. Um, and in what's a really cool project, they went out and uh, collected the data themselves by essentially scraping the API and serving, saving traces of out of service vehicles um, for a period of about six weeks in the fall of 2016. And this let us infer or let them infer uh, where the trips were occurring as well as observe where the out of service vehicles were driving around um, and provided essentially a trip table you can go. What you notice here is you notice that um, they're heavily concentrated in the downtown area, which is the exact same place where there's a lot of um, uh, public transit ridership. And that again could mean two things uh, in the cross-sectional data. If we just look at it cross-sectionally, we might say, okay, TNC trips and transit trips occur in the same, uh, same places. Therefore, they must complement each other. Uh, maybe it's people transferring that sort of stuff. Alternatively, we could say, hey, they're happening in the same place. They're probably competing with each other and um, uh, reducing transit ridership. We don't know from the cross-sectional data. The cross-sectional data doesn't tell us that. It only tells us that correlation. Hi, Greg. Uh, this this yeah. is your friendly moderator speaking. Just want to let you know you got about two or three minutes left. OK, perfect. So what we do then is we uh, add a time dimension. And in this case, if we look at 2010, what we see is that we can make the assumption in this particular case that there are no TNCs in 2010. And instead of looking cross-sectionally at the data, we look at the change from 2010 to 2015, 2016. And if ridership increases more uh, uh, than we otherwise would have predicted, then we conclude that it's uh, uh, the TNCs increase ridership. Otherwise, it's the opposite. Uh, this is something that's common throughout the US. Since uh, 2012, bus ridership in most cities is down 12 to 18%. Rail ridership is down 4 to 6% relative to its 2014 peak. So we've got a broader question of what data do we bring to the table to analyze this trend at a national level and not just in one place. And we can start to look at multi-city data from uh, um, uh, NTD and that sort of stuff. Question then is what do we do about it? Um, and what we need for that is a model. Having data doesn't let us test anything uh, uh, related to how to fix the problem. It only lets us observe what's on the ground. So we go back to the case where we need survey data to calibrate our model. And more than that, if we want scenarios to test, uh, we may need to define what those strategies are. And they aren't necessarily obvious. Uh, the project that we're starting on now is called the T-Score Center. It's a university transportation center that's aimed at defining a set of strategic visions for transit to sort of guide, uh, guide the future and to equip local planners with the tools needed to figure out how to respond to this problem. And what that looks like is this. We have in the middle box here, traveler behavior. Uh, our travel models, that's something that's pretty well developed. But on the top, what we're adding and we're tying to that is a prescriptive model, an optimization model that says, well, where should we run our buses to um, maximize ridership or maximize social good in some, in some way? And then we also have another layer to our model system on the bottom there, which is the simulation of sort of private mobility providers where their objective is to maximize their profit distinct from maximizing sort of individual utility. And so we're back to this uh, idea of building models, feeding them with uh, uh, data from different places, uh, but developing this top and this bottom layer, which are underinvested relative to uh, sort of the travel behavior piece of things. Uh, so that's the direction that we're going uh, forward. 
I'm going to stop there and uh, pass it uh, pass it back to you, Jim. All right. Thank you very much, Greg. And I think I can probably speak for everybody on this session when I say that we're excited to see how this research evolves. Um, like previously, I think we'll go ahead and it uh, looks like there has been some chatter related to this, although this may have also been some conversation related to the previous presenters. Um, but we'll go ahead and uh, take a quick poll break and I will administer the midway poll for this part of the session. Uh, then we'll get on with our uh, next presenter. And then of course, we'll uh, move into the Q&A for, for everyone. So let's see. There we go. Launch polling. Okay. So for this, uh, engaging the audience members to understand what you think is the best practice currently for travel surveys. And kind of watch as these roll in. Of course, we as the organizers sort of had some thoughts on how this might play out. I think we're seeing, yeah, it is consistent with the pre-session survey on, um, you know, there's value to using both. But the, the partnership between traditional and passive seems to be leading the pack. See, we've got some folks still kind of in one camp or the other. And then it, I think probably even a lot of us say when it comes to fusion or, or using in parallel, there's still some things we just need to understand before we can answer. All right, looks like the results have stabilized. All right. Well, thank you everyone for participating in that. And th thanks again, Greg. All right, uh, on to our next pre presentation. This one will be given by Stacy Bricka. Stacy is a senior research scientist with Macrosys, where she provides support to Federal Highway Administration's NHTS program, National Household Travel Survey. She also works with regional and state transportation agencies to help identify the best mix of traditional and emerging data sources and technologies to meet policy and planning data needs. She earned her PhD in community and regional planning from the University of Texas at Austin. All right, Stacy, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm doing all this on one monitor and I shared my screen and then I couldn't find the unmute button. So I'm still learning the software, hopefully. Um, so thank you guys uh, again for attending this session. When we were setting it up, we were trying to build from just, you have a choice of doing a survey or purchasing passive data to move on to the larger questions of when and how can these data sources be used together? When is it that they complement each other that you have a research question where one has more information for part of your to answer part of your question, and then the other is there to help fill the rest of what your data need is. Um, and so the next gen NHTS is an example of a data product that's going to be released, uh, collected, compiled, and released nationally um, that provides this complementary perspective or approach. Um, and I wanted to recognize um, my co-authors, Danny Jenkins and Patrick Zhang with Federal Highway, Lee Zhang and Sefer Gadir with the University of Maryland, um, as they may be answering some of the technical questions that you guys are putting into the chat. Um, Patrick was supposed to give this presentation, but he ended up out of the office this week. So um, hopefully I can give you guys the right level of detail. So there we go, okay. So as um, Federal Highway was conducting the National Household Travel Survey in 2017, um, it became very clear with the length of time it takes to design and then field the survey and get results that getting data every five to eight years is great from a time series perspective, but when you have policy questions and you have e-scooters literally showing up on corners overnight, that that five to eight year cycle to have new data was not sufficient. And so even while the 2017 was being wrapped up and, and uh, products were being developed from it, Federal Highway started working on the next gen NHTS design for the objectives of being able to release data more frequently, um, so that these emerging trends and modes could be captured. Um, also recognizing the passive data question, because even in 2017, passive data was beginning to be used. Um, and there, there's another, there's two other underlying design objectives. One is that there's um, a big need for long distance travel data. 
um, across the US at state DOTs and other agencies, um, but it's really hard to find them from a survey perspective. You don't even under, you, we don't have a frame for the universe. Um, and kind of as everyone cites in their papers about passive data, surveys cost money and we have low response rates. And so how could you design a survey that has lower respondent burden because part of that data is being uh, captured with a different data source. And so those questions were all part of when it went into the NHTS design. Um, and so there's really two parts to it. Um, one is what we call the core data component, which is your traditional survey. Um, to be able to collect data more frequently, um, Federal Highway is scaled back on the sample size from 26,000 households nationally to 7,500. The good news is that the data is collected every other year, so you get it more frequently. Um, but it was also trimmed um, so that the focus is on core data. Over 50 years of data has been collected, or 50 years from 69 to 2017, the NHTS has been conducted. And as you can imagine, there have been questions that have been on there coming because of historic or tradition, but they're not necessarily relevant in today's policy um, environment. And so to have a survey that's relevant for policy and planning, um, Federal Highway took a look at the content and, and kind of stripped out some questions that have been just hanging on uh, over the time. And it really focuses on what are tra what is travel behavior. And then for the 20, the, the next survey to be done, um, looking at a, really the question of emerging travel modes. The passive data component on the other side, the OD data, um, is looking at national flows um, between zones that are MSA or combinations of non-MSA areas within a state. And I know presentations will be posted so you can access it. So there's a link here um, to get it. Two things important about the design. One is that the data will be compiled for the same calendar year. So the passive data, the OD data component and the core survey component will be for the same time frame. Uh, the other thing is that agencies can add on to both of these um, products. And then that gives them more detailed data about their region. I'm gonna focus just in the interest of time on the national um, core data and the national OD. Um, and it really comes down to what Greg said. And I, I tried to write it down as he was saying it, but essentially you've got this small focused survey of 7,500 households with a lot of details that are facts that are known because that's reported as the respondents. And then you have the passive data coming from millions of devices that um, don't have demographic data or attitudinal data, and it's more aggregated in terms of a zonal point of view, as well as the weekday weekend counts. Um, and, but that may be what you need. And so you've got the, the, the richness of uh, the respondent detail and the demographics on the one hand, and then the richness of the OD travel patterns on the other hand. Um, the other part of it comes in again with the details about who's doing the travel, which um, from a travel behavior point of view has always been important is who is the traveler and why do they travel. Um, and this slide just shows that for the core data it's reported um, and it's mainly local in nature. Uh, if someone does report a long distance trip on their travel day it's captured, but for the most part the, the travel surveys capture local travel. Um, for the national, on the national side though, that there's the ability using techniques that are gonna be shared in open source to show an imputation of mode and of trip purpose. Um, and for at the national level, time of day is not there. It's just that OD matrix of the 582 zones showing inter and intra-zonal trips. Um, but at the add-on purchases, those, um, those details about the travel are more detailed, um, they're in, so like for example, travel mode for an add-on would have walk and walk trips um, imputed, uh, trip purpose would be more refined. And so, but at the national level, at least we have these numbers of trips. And while the plan is not to fuse the data sources, um, both data sources, the plan is um, to, to uh, validate them against the same uh, HPMS and the national transit database and just look at the trends of travel and how they're coming in through both data sources in the same time period, but from households and from devices. And so in terms of which data source is better, um, you know, I just got my, I just went in for my eye doctor appointment. Is this one better than that one? And they show you two different views and one's slightly crisper than the other and you're trying to decide. And that's what we have here with these data. Um, if you're looking for rich detail about the demographics um, and you're looking at mainly local travel, 
then that's what the survey data provides for you. But if you're really interested more in OD flows um, and you're comfortable with the algorithms or developing algorithms and using census data or survey data to help infer who's doing the travel, but your focus is those OD flows, um, then that's where the passive data has its strength. It's, it's a much larger sample of trips, fewer details, um, but it just, um, if that's your question, then that's the better answer. And so the idea is that you, from my perspective, what is it that you're trying, what question are you trying to answer? Um, and then go for that data source that's there um, with the understanding that they do reside side by side, they do describe the same time period, um, and this would help you to decide kind of which one's better based on your decision. So with that, um, I think Jim, I definitely thank you all for your time and I uh, appreciate you joining us. So Jim. All right, thank you very much, Stacy. And yeah, I was just about to chime in with your, uh, with your time warning and, and you, you nailed it. So, uh, all right, so I did see, uh, I'll, I'll note uh, that, uh, Greg, one question did pop up in the chat um, specific to your presentation, but in the interest of time, because I don't want to squeeze our third and final uh, part of the session, uh, perhaps you could, uh, oh, looks like you already got the answer to Krishnan's uh, question. So let's uh, pose just a, maybe one or two questions to each of our panelists. Um, and let's, let's go with one that I think is probably uh, on everybody's minds. And you know, I, I think this is probably directed a little bit more towards passive data but you know, it, it obviously relates to all data, you know, the importance of representativeness and you know, accounting for biases. So you know, in the research that you um, both have done, and we'll, we'll start with you, Stacy, uh, just because you've got your mute, mute off, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, how, how did you, you know, like how important was representativeness and how did you, you know, ensure, especially in the passive data, that that was there? And, and then how did you, you know, kind of uh, account for any biases? It's a great question and the answer is still coming and being developed. And that's actually something that I was hoping to learn from the discussion um, that we have today and, and how it goes on. Because with survey data, we compare to census. Um, we know demographically who participates and who doesn't. Um, and we, it, it's almost like with the surveys, the focus is on getting it demographically correct. Um, and then using weights and expansion factors as necessary to fill in for populations that didn't necessarily perform, but we're not, always behaviorally correct with our data sets. And I think that the passive data, um, particularly when you can validate it against counts or against uh, volume data um, and the flow data from your models or how your count data is showing, I don't know that I wanna say it's behaviorally correct as a whole, but I think that because it does display and capture travel that's taking place, um, that it is perhaps a little bit more behaviorally correct, at least for certain modes of travel than the, the survey data. Um, and so I guess it boils down to knowing the data sources and knowing the gaps in them and knowing how they're constructed. Um, and once you know that, you can identify the bias and then you understand better how to apply it. Great, thanks. Greg? Uh, I'm gonna answer that question with an example. And that example is looking at um, transit fare card transaction data in the Bay Area, so the Clipper card system specifically. Uh, you look at some smart card transactions, and if you've got 95, 98% penetration, if you're required to use it to ride the bus, it doesn't matter. There's not going to be much bias in there. In the Clipper card case, it was optional. And at the time, I think it was maybe 50% of uh, transit users used it. Um, but typically you would have, um, uh, it, it was, what we did is we compared those data to, um, to an onboard transit survey. And when you look at it in comparison to the onboard, tr onboard transit survey, you see that uh, the Clipper card uh, underrepresents low income riders and minority riders and overrepresents high income riders. So it's sort of the same thing as any sort of credit card or smartphone or anything like that. Um, in transit, that's really important because your ridership is quite weighted towards low income riders very often. Um, so, and, and it's also important from sort of a environmental justice standpoint of we wanna be really careful about using a data set if we're sort of systematically uh, um, biasing against 
certain users that we care a lot about. Uh, but that's going to depend a lot on the data set. Um, and I, I think it's just going to be really specific to what you're dealing with. Definitely. All right. Thank you. All right. I, uh, I'm going to ask one more and ask for maybe a quick answer. And I think this, this could be related to the research you presented, or it might just be, you, you know, sharing your thoughts sort of, you know, how the industry goes forward. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with Greg this time, and then we'll go back to Stacy, and then we'll, we'll hand it off to the uh, man of the hour for part three. Um, but so uh, first with Greg, how, how should we change the traditional survey to focus on capturing the information we cannot get from passive data? Um, I mean, I think broadly, I think um, the smartphone enabled travel surveys seem really cool. And uh, Stacy and someone probably knows, uh, there's others on this call, I'm sure, who know more about those than I do. But um, uh, trip purpose and mode, uh, from what I've seen, I think are still really hard to impute. Like, how do I tell the difference between uh, from a GPS trace of whether someone is going to eat at a restaurant or going to work at a restaurant, there's a lot of value in just asking. So that seems like uh, sort of the app-based surveys seem like a really good technology. Great, thanks. Stacy. I want to acknowledge that a few people in answering the pre-registration survey did say that, that, that they gave the same answer as Greg. Um, so that I think it's definitely using technology to make it easier for the respondent to report their trips is definitely whether it's um, a, a more respondent cognitively um, focused reporting kind of program for them to fill out on the web as they go through the day or if it's a smartphone app that does trip detection and gets prompts them to fill in what their purpose of their mode was that's clearly part of it um, I have to say that I, I think that travel demand modelers are very data hungry and want as much data as they can get. And sometimes trying to fit all that into the travel survey, the, tr the current design of the travel survey doesn't always work. And so I want to remind everyone um, that I think that it was Ram Pandalia or Chandra Bhatt came up with this kind of approach that we do have the core survey, but that we ask ancillary surveys follow-up questions to get more of the detail that's needed for modelers, but not at the time of that initial survey. So whether it's um, we do a survey and then we have a follow-up state of preference, or we have a follow-up question with more detail about vehicle acquisition, or uh, um, I think that there are ways to ask the question, perhaps more than one uh, occurrence with that respondent to get the data we need rather than trying to have them do a 30 minute survey, which um, I think we may be the only ones in the US that ask such long surveys. Um, so being smart about and being kind of in, smart about how we're asking and getting the data from our respondents, I think is real important. Great, thank you. All right, a uh, you know, virtual round of applause for our presenters, for all of them so far. And um, I am now going to hand this off to Eric Sabina with CDOT to take us into part three, which will be the really fun interactive portion of this session. Oh dear, I'm supposed to be fun. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, uh, I think, uh, I was wondering if this would turn out this way, and I had written a brief bio, and since it seems like I'm introducing myself, I'll just read the, the brief bio that I wrote here. Uh, it says, Eric, that's me, Eric Sabina is the manager of Colorado, at the Colorado Department of Transportation's Information Management Branch, which includes GIS, traffic count, and forecasting staff. He holds a BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado and an MS in transportation from MIT. He's led numerous projects, including development of activity-based models at the Denver Regional Council of Governments and at the, at the DOT, led the first travel survey of the 4MPO Colorado Front Range region, and is in the early stages of leading the first statewide travel survey in Colorado. So that's me, Hi, everybody. <laughs> I will now attempt to uh, share my screen and see if this works. Um, so let's see here. I've generally done this before. So someone will let me know if it's actually sharing. We're looking at your email, Eric. And I do cool. apologize. I think I was supposed to introduce you. Um, so yeah, we're looking oh, no at problem. your email. There it is. You toot my own horn anytime. And are we are we looking at full screen here? Are we looking at the or there we it still is. Have... Now okay. you're full screen. 
Okay, good. All right, so I just wanted to show a picture of some mountains being that this is Colorado. So this is our, our uh, initial slide. Um, you know, I, uh, I looked at the other presenters' presentations and I spent a lot of time thinking about the you know, very broad uh, subject and the many issues that are coming at us these days. And you know, I, I, I realized that I don't know enough, nor do I have the time to cover everything that uh, could be said, but hopefully the point here is just to sort of uh, you know, cue up some interest and some thoughts among the participants on the various subjects that are related here and get you all asking questions and, and giving your thoughts. So with that, you know, just thinking back to where we've been in the past, I've been in this game a long time. So some of it that past uh, I was myself doing, you know, we, we used to in the past in the modeling world, which was where most of the travel surveys were really for in my experience. Um, we, we were basically doing intra-urban, you know, MPO region for the most part, uh, travel modeling, and we were really just doing typical weekday stuff. And uh, it, it often was rather highway focused, although, you know, as we know, over the last few decades, as, as uh, time has passed, there's been uh, sort of evolution toward multimodalism and so forth. And basically, the, the lesser priorities were kind of everything else. And, you know, we've, we've had several presentations about some of those other everything else's. And uh, they are, uh, you know, quite a variety of planning and engineering interests that are out there. Uh, you know, Colorado being a week, a recreation state, I think about the recreation problem a lot. Uh, a special event survey was already described, and we are also thinking about that in regard to uh, transit ridership analysis that can have significant special event uh, ridership components. Uh, Non-motorized uh, these days is becoming even bigger interest than it used to be. I keep hearing that during the COVID period, there's a tremendous increase in, in walking and bicycling. Uh, long distance has been mentioned in these presentations as well. And I do want to emphasize, uh, you know, long distance, again, sitting in a tourist state like Colorado, long distance for us is from the entire world. So, you know, it's not just uh, intrastate uh, recreation. Although you know, there's plenty of inner city and interstate recreation that goes on here. And we could go on and list many other similar uh, interests that have all you know, gotten sort of uh, partial attention, especially in regard to uh, data acquisition. Uh, let's see if I can make this slide move. So the, the other thing I was asked to sort of uh, ruminate about was where we're going. And I started to think about where we're going in the context of sort of key drivers. And again, I'm sure these are not all of them. Uh, see my last bullet on that. Um, but uh, you know, the, as we you know, stating the obvious data availability is changing at a pretty dizzying pace for an old dog like me. Um, the the modes are likewise changing very rapidly. And you know, we've all been kind of whipsawed about that over the last six months, where micro mobility was going great guns and then at least by some people's measures it sort of cratered during covid and here in denver you can still see quite a lot of it i'm not you know i don't have a visceral sense of how it's going elsewhere but my guess would be it's going to come back pretty pretty hard when we we sort of emerge from this period we're in here uh continuing urbanization around the globe i think is a major uh, theme for us uh, and that drives a lot of changes that uh, we are uh, trying to implement in, in the data and modeling world. Uh, global warming hardly needs any discussion, so I won't talk about it very much, but obviously it, it has a lot of effect on, on the, the types of analysis that we're being asked to conduct. I can, I can tell you that, especially in Colorado, where the, the, uh, the state uh, uh, administration is very active in, in, in mitigation measures and asking us to give them one number after another to help them figure out what to do. So, you know, we come down to, you know, what do we have now compared to the old days and what can we do with it? And, you know, we've touched on uh, a number of these points here in the presentation so far. So I'm feeling really good about the spectrum that we've heard today. You know, weekend and recreation, long distance, special events. You know, I, I've already hit on some of these. I do want to note uh, rural and small towns. Again, speaking from a Colorado perspective, for example, we have uh, quite a number of, of mountain recreation towns. They have very special transportation uh, characteristics that make them quite challenging to, uh, to, to gather data for and to model. And then, you know, we also have, as, as uh, Greg particularly mentioned, much uh, greater ability to gather trend data 
And I, I always like to throw in my little phrase on this subject, which is um, everybody wants trend data and trend data is hard. And I think, you know, the, the next generation of data sources that we are, uh, that we're discussing today in part, uh, really makes the trend data situation obviously an awful lot easier to deal with than it used to be when it was something close to impossible sometimes it seemed. So we have an awful lot of new targets to hit based on all these drivers that I've been talking about, automated vehicles, which are gonna come someday, uh, various emerging modes that I've discussed. We didn't really talk touch on connected vehicles today at all, but you know, that's a thing that's out there. Uh, electric Electrified vehicles, which you know several states, again, including Colorado are going hard in that direction issues relating to charging those things, other clean fuels that there may be such as hydrogen fuels. Uh, so there's, there, are, there are an awful lot of other things that we're being asked to opine about and, and come up with some, some solid numbers. So the, the summary that Stacy gave me before the, this, uh, this uh, session was to make some remarks about what should we be doing, quote unquote. And again, I'm sure that all I'm gonna do is scratch the surface on that and you all will have better things to say about it than I have. Uh, one thing that I was really thinking of before the presentation, and it seemed to grow stronger in my mind as I was listening to the various presentations, is it feels like to some extent that the data sources we've been discussing, LBS or passive or whatever we're calling it this week, uh, data and, and the traditional old style data, they feel like they're starting to resemble each other more than they used to do. When you think of the, uh, uh, the cell phone app uh, technology for gathering traditional survey data now, it starts to smell an awful lot more like Google following everybody around like you know, they do for many of us. Uh, so it's, it's th that one is starting to head more into the passive data direction. And LBS data, as we know, they're, they're working very hard on things like trying to improve the demographics that they have associated with it. Uh, trying to, as, as was mentioned earlier, trying to do a better job of imputing uh, mode and and actual destination and activity and that sort of thing. So I do wonder if what we're going to see, and this is me throwing out an idea for to prime everybody's intellectual pump here, is are we going to just see these things headed more toward each other in the future, and they're going to they're going to start to look more alike. Maybe we'll start to do our our uh, our active surveys more in a panel style, which again starts to make the the active surveys look more like the passive surveys. You know, issues that are that are serious, which were all mentioned. So I'm afraid I'm repeating what many of the presenters have said. So I'll I'll say them quickly, since not waste a lot of time. Uh, self selection bias is a big challenge with these data, as we well understand. Uh, Stacy talked about the issue of transparency, which is huge for us modelers. You know, if we know what the biases are or what the sources of biases are in the survey data, we can in many cases correct for them. If we don't know, then we can't. Uh, and then I've already mentioned that, you know, LBS data has some, some a lot of fuzz in it. It's a, it's a pretty fuzzy microscope in many cases. And I expect to see lots of work in, in trying to sharpen up that view. And, you know, sort of finishing with Eric's version of the, the tra travel demand modeling and data holy grail, that we get to the point where passive data has all the virtues of active data. We have good demographics associated with it. We're able to do something that's not really imputing, but is pretty much knowing, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, case you can all see me, knowing what the activity is at the destination and many of those other things that we can get explicitly in the survey data that, that, we, that we gather actively, while of course retaining all the virtues that the passive data has, such as large size, uh, the you know continues through time, et cetera. I think that is my last slide. And since the purpose of this session is to get people thinking and talking, I hope that that's at least either generated some, gee, that was a good idea, Eric, or you're completely wrong and I'm now going to tell you about it. So with that, I will turn it over and back to Stacy, I believe. All right. Eric, would you mind just going back to your slide five? Sure. Let me uh, let's see which one's five. There we go. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah, there we go. What should we be doing? Um, so I want to and thank you, Eric, for your thoughts on this, um, particularly as an agency who is um, having to answer this question, not only technically, but for your director. Um, and, you know, you've got decision makers and, and board members that are wanting to know why or why you're not doing this or why you're doing that. So um, behind the technical discussion that we have, there's always that burden of proof that we have to provide to, to those that we answer to. 
Um, and so I want to start, kind of take your question of what should we be doing and go back um, to the other presenters um, and to start perhaps with Greg and then go to Lavanya and to Samit. Um, what else do you think we should be doing um, in addition to what Eric has raised here? Uh, I'll answer quick. I mean, one, I thought uh, Eric's spot on on a lot of this stuff. Um, and then I think uh, the only thing I'd add is that I think a lot of times uh, one of the things we really need to do is define, uh, and, and he kind of does this in the slide before of what are the big questions we're trying to answer. And so what is the mapping between those questions and sort of these data? And that might be a little different depending on, on the questions. Thanks, Greg. Lavanya? Or Sumit, Lavanya, I think you're on mute. Yeah, before we purchase any of these data sets or doing the surveys, our first question should be, what are we going to use this data? Uh, how do we apply this data? So in my case, it's special event data and for the activity-based model, you all know how detailed it is. So we need a mode of travel, party size, demographic data, and trip chain pattern. So we preferred surveys, uh, uh, surveys. but again, I see the opportunity. If we could use LBS data as well, we can purchase uh, LBS data and uh, and, uh, and using their phone numbers, we can do uh, phone interviews and obtain details as this, what we need. But uh, the main problem with the LBS data and intercept service is uh, capturing, I feel personally capturing uh, uh, details, uh, demographic details or trip details is very easy in intercept service compared to phone interviews. Very, very good points there as well. Um, and the whole in-person versus the phone, how do you reach your universe? Um, yes. Sumit, any thoughts of what should we be doing? Yeah, um, I, I like the example that you cited earlier about um, doing follow-up surveys so we don't just get a point in time, but also see how travel patterns are changing over time. Um, we've done a, a survey of COVID travel patterns, for example, how people's patterns changed after COVID, how many, how more likely were they to work from home. And we're seeing that change over time because we've got thousands of people that volunteer to opt into that every three months or so. We're seeing that people were, you know, in, Mel in March, we probably got about 90% working from home. Now it's changed over time. Um, one of the things that I think that the, the survey data can help supplement um, LBS the, the most probably from our um, applications is the use of linked trips because um, one of the challenges with location-based data is once uh, for most of the providers once you stop moving for five minutes your trip is over so when we're doing a, a resort plan for example if you leave your hotel and go to get breakfast and then go to the beach you can't link all those trips together so if you had a survey to try to um, you know say I went here 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 and here then you can use that to uh, better mesh that with the, with the LBS data. Good point as well. And even um, uh, like in the surveys, depending on how the data is collected, sometimes the transit trip is where you got on to ultimately where you exited the system, which Greg's data, I don't, depending on whether transfers have to be collected. Um, but yeah, how do you even just break up a simple trip like that? Not even just in your region, not just the long distance aspect of it. Um, so good. So to the, those of you in attendance, and I know we have a lot of you, um, if you have a general question for the panel, you can put it in the chat box. Um, and while we're waiting for those to come in, I have one other question for the panel and this I wanna broaden to Lita, Jim and, and Guy. Um, if we think about what we need or what you're moving towards in five years or 10 years, um, are all of your data needs covered by the survey and the passive data? Are there things that neither, that is there a gap, even considering these two data sources that we're looking at today, are there gaps that are, that are still needing to be filled for your models and for your applications? So I'm gonna ask that question and then we'll watch and see if others come up in the chat to open it up to the group. So who of the panel wants to start with that one? <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll go Please ahead. Oh, go ahead, Dee. Dee, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to say that um, one of the things that it's very important for regional trilemon models is anything that's related to socioeconomics and demographics types of data. For instance, zero car households, where the zero car households located, that sort of thing. So that's the type of data that is typically obtained from a traditional type of survey. And hopefully over time, uh, big data can capture that. But, but at this point, that might be one of those items that uh, you know, we need to bridge the gap here, get more. It, you can do data imputation, of course, but it's always nice to get it from the source as far as uh, demographics and socioeconomic data, especially uh, car ownership, zero car households, that sort of thing. Hmm. Good. Uh, Lita, Jim, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess my first thought was, do we ever have enough data? <laughs> I would say no. <laughs> but is there anything in particular that you're, you're uh, lacking in that is not going to come from either of these sources? Is there a third data source that we need to start thinking about now? I think, you know, with this data talks a lot about the behavioral components, but I, I think, you know, on the validation end as well, you know, once we estimate and calibrate our models and just the ability to show um, you know, how well they're performing, whether that's better speed data, better count data, ridership data, and whatnot. Um, we've got a question in the chat about the difference between long range planning and operational planning. And let, let me let Jim answer and then we'll move on okay. to that one, thanks. So, Stacy, I, I don't know if this is necessarily a third data source, but you know, thinking back to, um, you know, just the questions with uh, that a lot of planners and engineers are struggling with these emerging modes. I mean, there are modes that probably have yet to be uh, invented yet, and so how do we? Uh, of course, we can't know today what those are, but um, it's you know, if the last five, ten years is any predictor, you know, they're, they're, they're probably in the works and, you know, how do agencies or, or uh, even, you know, big data companies get their hands on this data? Yeah, and that actually, one of the big topics, and we've talked about it at TRB, um, not last year, we had a panel on it the year before last, is the whole use of the personal vehicle to deliver groceries, um, Uber driving. So you have personal vehicles that are used for both commercial and personal travel. Um, and traditionally, we would say if you made, you know, if that was a work related trip or a commercial trip, you put it on your commercial vehicle survey and we only want household survey, uh, personal travel on the household survey. Um, and now uh, I know the, the next gen is going to be collecting both. So if you make personal, if you make commercial travel in a personal vehicle, we're trying to capture that. Um, but it seems like those gray lines are where um, we're, we're missing data and we don't even have anything. Is there anything right now that helps to validate that? I mean, I'd, I'd jump in there, Stacy, and I think you're right that there's the gray line, but even beyond the gray line, we're, and Byron makes this point yeah. in, in the questions here, uh, service delivery stuff, like even in a UPS truck, we know basically nothing about that. And those are going up anecdotally huge amounts over the past several years, uh, especially during COVID, everyone's ordering stuff. Um, does that reduce travel? Well, it maybe reduces my personal travel. It might not reduce sort of total travel. We don't know. Uh, and that is just a natural thing to, to try to get data on. And that's gonna be a fight to get data on, honestly. Uh, I don't know what the solution is. Maybe there's a way you could serve it. Uh, survey it. Maybe you need to regulate it somehow that it must be shared. I assume the companies know exactly where every delivery is made, uh, but we don't get that. So what do you do about that? I don't know. Hopefully uh, someone else can tell me the answer there. And that actually brings up another point from a consumer point of view. Some of the general polls or general topic surveys are showing that people um, shop online they'll go to Lowe's and Home Depot and then stand in the store and order on Amazon the product they want to be delivered to their home. My husband, case in point, <laughs> I think that's where he is right now. So he's made two different tri trips to two different stores. And when he's in that second store, he's gonna order it from Amazon and generate a third trip to the house. 
So we don't ask, and again, this would be a follow-up. I do not um, recommend asking it as part of your regular survey, but as a follow-up, if you're interested in this type of topic, where did you make that online order? You know, does it really stop your travel? We also see that people that work from home, at least in the 2017 NHTS, they generate, they still travel on their travel day because they go to lunch, they take the kids to school, they run errands during their lunch hour from home rather than from the workplace. And so these behaviors that we think are reducing household travel may not be. We just, we, we don't have the data to show us. And I'm not sure that, that the passive data gets us to it because there's all these other behaviors that influence travel that are not present in the passive data. And to me, that's a data gap as well. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and ask Leonard's question. Um, the differences in these two data sources for long range planning and operational planning. So if your question is operational planning, is one data source better than the other? Is there anyone on the panel that wants to take that one? Submit, so this may be kind of related to your uh, event studies. Yeah, that's a little bit more operational in nature. Right. And I think, um, you know, we had the, the passive survey. We, <laughs> we had the survey data um, and we really did feel like we had to implement that with the location based data so we could see the differences between specific um, events. Um, when we're working with the resort communities, it's the same type of thing where, um, you know, when we did our study for Tahoe, for example, they had they had done surveys, the, uh, the Visitors Bureau had done their surveys on who's coming to the basin. And when we um, supplement that or uh, use location-based data to come up to the same number, our number was nearly four times higher than what anybody had predicted before in terms of the total number of unique visitations into the Lake Tahoe Basin. So that was um, an eye-opening experience, certainly. What we didn't know from the data. Anyone else on the panel wanna talk about operational versus long-range planning? and experiences using either data source for those? No, okay. So um, Ali also had a comment. Should we look into changing our modeling practices and developing new modeling structures which can use passive data? Um, so instead of, and, and I had this quote on my presentation that the internet says came from Albert Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. And so this isn't a problem. I mean, this is an opportunity. So um, what does this data allow us to do that we haven't done yet? And I think um, Greg or Josie, can you talk a little bit about the passive data models? Because I think we're already moving in that direction, Ali. Yeah, can you promote um, Josie so she can talk? Or I don't know if she can, if she's still here. But what I just say is I think um, the opportunity you have is in effect to auto calibrate your model. I mean, we spend a lot of time and effort calibrating travel demand models. Uh, and there's a good argument that we could spend that time better elsewhere if we just could spit in the current data and have it sort of fix itself or whatever it is. And what uh, uh, Josie is doing with her CityCast model is she's in effect, instead of building a travel demand model, she is taking the passive data and creating a, a set of tours or trips or that sort of stuff, then then gets fed into uh, MATSIM in effect to sort of simulate the past. So you get some leeway to change modes, change time of day, change path, uh, but rather than feeding it with a tour generation model, you're feeding it from the passive data, if you will. Uh, which is, I mean, I think you end up, you end up in a similar place with a model you can run scenarios with, which is kind of cool. Lita, you've also used passive data with survey data in your models. Any, any other thoughts on that? Um, yeah, my data uh, was used primarily, I've used passive data primarily in a, in a validation role. And so using the behavioral data to do my model estimation and calibration where the data are really rich, um, but then using that larger sample passive data to um, validate, for example, the trip distribution models where in a traditional household survey, um, the observations are fairly small on any zone interchange and many zone interchanges won't even have data. 
Um, and so that's how I've mostly done it. I am familiar with the work that Josie has done and I'm, I'm excited about that. I feel when I think about that question between operations and um, long range planning, I feel like that that's the nut, nut we really have to crack is that with operations with a shorter time frame, I think that this passive data holds so much more value because um, we're dealing more with current situation. But in a forecasting where we're looking 30 years into the future, we really need predictive models that can help us evaluate different scenarios. And so how can we take this passive data and you know, put it into a format that allows it to be more predict predictive and, and integrated into a, into a long range? And it's not just getting those base year models looking great, but then how do we forecast that data that those models are hungry for in a future year scenario. I can't look down the table at the other panelists to see if anyone else wants to comment on this question. <laughs> uh, I agree with Lita uh, on model validation using the passive data. And uh, we can obtain travel time, speed, uh, origin and destination, as well as triplet distribution, triplet frequency, triplet itself from the passive data. So these could be used in model validation. In the validation. And is there, you know, one of the opportunities we have, particularly because so many, the, several agencies, when we did the opening survey said, they're here to learn more that they're gonna begin the path that others are much further down the road on in terms of using passive and survey data um, and or both fused or unfused to answer their modeling questions. And so how do we best communicate what we know and what we've learned for those agencies that are trying to answer the question and get the technical documentation together to answer their boss in terms of why, which data source or when to use what? So Lavanya, let's start with you because your, your video is showing on the screen and then we'll just go down. Samit, you're next okay. and then uh, Greg, Jim, Lita, Eric and okay. me. We'll just go down the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're looking into calibrating the model, I would get uh, more detailed uh, survey data. And then if you're looking into validating the model, then we can use the passive data. Okay, good. Thank you, Samit. Yeah, I, I agree with that assessment. Okay, um, so who's, uh, Greg, you're next. I'm sorry, Stacy, I missed the question. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 60% of our audience are, um, are regional and state uh, government workers um, working for those agencies. And about, I think 20% of those that answered the pre-survey are on this webinar to learn more to help them make decisions or to understand better the technical differences so that they can answer their boss's questions. So what, um, what where do you go for information? How do we best help inform them or what resources are available to them uh, to answer these questions and, and help get them started so they avoid what we learned when we started on the path? I mean, I think honestly, it's, it's talking to your peers. I think it's, if I wanna know um, street light data, I need to talk to someone who's tried it. And I think just a phone conversation is going to tell you a lot more than whatever it says on the website. So in a sense, what we need is people here where it's like, you know who to call, you know which of your peers has done it, you can ask around that kind of stuff. And, and talking to Samit, for example, who's like, okay, here's, here's the things you need to consider, or here's the stuff you got to look at. That's hugely valuable if I'm picking up a new data set and trying to um, take advantage of it or trying to decide um, if I want to buy it because you don't really know until you get your hands dirty. Right. And if I could add something to that, um, what we found helpful for our clients is actual, like, um, really simple, detailed questions that they want to answer. And then we can say, yes, no, you can answer this, or you can't answer this, or no, that's just beyond the, the range of expertise. Because if you, if you don't do that, if you leave it open-ended, we're just, we want to get um, demographics. You know, that's so open-ended. You may or may not get what you were looking for, or it may not be the level of precision that you need to actually be able to use it effectively. So if you can drill down to specific detailed questions, that makes it a lot easier. And you're also helping to manage expectations. 
Jim, you're next. All right. Well, yeah, I, I think I have maybe an interesting perspective on this for somebody that works for a passive data analytics company now, but comes from a long you know, storied past of, of working as a planner for an MPO. Um, I mean, I, I first I'll start kind of from you know, wearing my current career hat is, you know, it, like if you, if you want to know, especially being a passive data, um, it, it, you know, the nuance of it or, or how it can be used or, you know, what its biases are, you know, talk to the provider. Um, the, uh, you know, I mean, the, there is a wealth of, you know, information and documentation on the, you know, the, the good and the bad and what it, what it works well for and what it maybe doesn't work as well for. Um, but also, I, I mean, I think at the same time, it's incumbent upon the, the, you know, uh, companies that are compiling and creating this data to, you know, be very transparent and, uh, you know, make, make as much information publicly available as, as possible. Um, but also kind of on the flip side of that, I mean, I think I, I agree with Sumit and, and others that, you know, there's, is talk to your peers, you know, talk to, um, you know, maybe agencies of a similar type. Uh, but I think there's also, you know, there are organizations that already do a really great job of compiling this information. I mean, the, the Trattle Mobile Improvement Program, um, the, you know, even just, you know, ITE forums and, um, you know, in, and also, you know, great organizations like, like Zephyr or, or TRB, you know, so I, I think it's, you know, all of those and, and many more that I'm not, you know, coming to mind right and at, right off the, you know, bat is, uh, you know, just, just keep doing what they do and, and create, you know, circulars and, and uh, compile information and, and try and, you know, keep it in a in easily accessible place. So, uh, so practitioners can, can learn more. Thank you. And Lita, this comes to you next. Um, yeah, I get the hard job because everybody else has already given all the great <laughs> answers. <laughs> I second all of that. I, I guess maybe what I will add is I think that um, we as practitioners um, have to be willing to step outside of our boxes of comfort and um, do things differently from the way we've done them in the past uh, from the standpoint of exploring some of this data. And I really, you know, I think Greg said it well, reaching out to folks who've done this before. I think that we need more use cases and we need more exploration. I'm excited about this concept of fusion and how we can partner the rich behavioral data with the, the data where you've got a lot of observations to inform. But I really think it's up to us to be willing to invest in new data sources and be willing to go down that path of exploration um, to see how we can better use this data to inform our modeling and planning processes. Thanks, Lita. Mm -hmm. Guy, I'm gonna to come to you and then Eric, we're gonna just wrap it all up with you. Yeah, just in addition to what everybody else said, I would add the travel survey manual. I think there's an inversion right now and uh, travel survey methods, the Arabic community worked on that for few years in the past, but also above and beyond all that, I would say you get to know your region first. So I would first start with a, say a data purchase of origin destination data, get good coverage for your region, and then supplement, complement with travel surveys, say um, to reach out to the uh, hard to reach areas or environmental justice areas where you have holes in that OD data. And then, but definitely you, know, you get the best of both worlds this way. Thanks, Guy. Uh, and Eric. Yeah, you. thanks. Uh, I, I, I think I'm just going to give a one thing as a plug to TRB. You know, if you haven't already done so, which probably most of you have, but um, signing up for TRB's, you know, news feed or whatever it is they properly call it that, you know, I, I get whatever it is. I don't actually know how often it comes to me, but it's at least once a week and probably several times a week that they just have a compilation of various papers and circulars and everything you can imagine. And I get a lot of uh, just, I just skim down that thing. And pretty much every time there are two or three items that are of considerable interest to me, but I would certainly echo the comment about networking, you know, just, you know, I mean, folks who are interested in, in, uh, in talking to, uh, Let's see here if I can get this to move. I don't know if people are seeing my screen, but if they want to talk to me, they can send me an email or they can call me and um, I'll be happy to talk to you. And, and obviously there are lots of other folks on this call, uh, whether presenters or otherwise, who know an awful lot and, you know, don't, don't hesitate to just call us up and, and uh, you know, ask us questions about it and share your insights as well. Thanks, Eric. And I think, um, 
the I do want to and, and maybe Eric, I, I need to find the link and then I'll put it in the, the chat that we save uh, and respond to so that attendees have the questions and answers in one place. Um, but there was a team at peer review panel um, that met and came out with a report. And at the end of that report are questions to ask as you're purchasing the data. It's actually a couple of years old at this point and it may need to be refreshed and updated with new questions because we have answers. But that's always a good source as well um, to look in terms of uh, those of you that are exploring this for the first time, the passive data options. Um, and then the so travel survey manual, as Guy mentioned, has got good information about the methods and what's going on in travel surveys. So um, from a time point of view, I guess I'm going to go ahead and close. Um, I do want to thank Elizabeth Saul, who has been in the background, who admitted all of you into the room and is recording this session. She'll help us to save the uh, PowerPoint so that you can access them. We will do an ex uh, take the chat and turn it into a document somehow so that you, those of you that were in the YouTube room can see that. Um, I thank again uh, the organizing committee that helped put this together, the presenters and, and Guy in the background. Um, and for everyone in your comments and your questions that you submitted in the chat. So hopefully this is just the first of many discussions and thanks to Zephyr for letting us um, have this time. <laughs>